Hi, this is Mike Hendrickson from the AI Conference in San Francisco. I'm here with Nicola from Intel. Nicola, how are you doing? Great, nice to be here. How has the event been for you so far? It's been pretty exciting. I think you know there were some great speakers this morning. It was really fun to see Andrew and kind of go up there and do his little chalkboard talk and give everyone a, a good lecture, I think, as a good professor does. Yeah, Andrew from Coursera, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're with Intel, mm -hmm. and you guys have AI everywhere. We do. So, you know, there was a saying a couple of years ago, software is eating the world. Mm -hmm. It's probably really AI eating the world. Nowadays, it seems like it, doesn't it? Yeah, and can you talk a little bit about how Intel's AI programs are working? Yeah, so I mean, Intel has really the world's leading portfolio of AI products. We span everything from Xeons in the cloud and data center all the way to uh, Movidius vision processing units that are these low power vision compute networks that you can fly in drones. And so we really span everything from the edge to the cloud. Uh, and that's really important because, you know, there's not a single one size fits all solution for AI. Uh, every customer has different needs and there's so many different ways of deploying it. There's so many different applications that they all require different types of solutions. And so our approach is really to have a whole portfolio of solutions to, to really address all of our customers' needs. And so today you guys also announced something about uh, being able to try your AI stuff in your free cloud or? Yeah, so we have uh, various cloud platforms to look Dev at. Dev something? The DevCon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't speak too much about that. It's, it just got announced, so even I think across Intel, we're all still learning about it, but it's pretty exciting. Um, new, new programs really want to democratize AI so that uh, you know, people all over the world can, can use it and, and really realize its applications. So Intel, you're, you're from the hardware layer, but mm -hmm. you're all the way through the stack in your AI offerings. Is that so from the chip? Absolutely. FPG, all that, all the way up through? Yeah, so I mean, from our um, FPGA, so I work in the Programmable Solutions Group, um, and so we look at uh, FPGAs, which are Field Programmable Gate Arrays. So those are uh, programmable chips. So at that level, you can really design your circuitry to meet that your specific algorithms and AI needs. Uh, you know, we also obviously have our CPUs, which offer the most flexible applications of AI. Uh, and then we work with um, our own software developers and software developers around the world to optimize software applications all the way up the stack so that you can use all kinds of AI frameworks um, and it's optimized for all of our different types of uh, silicon and, and applications. Are you seeing any in interesting industry um, trends towards who's using FPGAs? You know, traditionally, FPGAs are really used by uh, a couple types of segments, um, people like military who have very custom applications. And so now we're starting to see a lot of growth in, in the data center, which is really exciting. Um, by applying FPGAs to a data center, you can get um, really scale your, your, um, your growth, your applications, get really high throughput, really high uh, bandwidth and, and uh, energy efficiency. And so, um, you know, Microsoft's a really great example of this. Uh, a few weeks ago, they just announced their Brainwave um, project, and so they were able to eke out 40 teraflops of performance on our Stratix 10 FPGAs, which is pretty mind-blowing. Um, and they're not done, so they actually have a roadmap to 90 teraflops on that same piece of hardware. Um, and that's a really interesting application of, of how they're using FPGAs. Um, by they're actually getting that performance by using new data types. So they're actually using that flexibility of the FPGA um, to get the exact level of performance they need and the accuracy they need and drive really high levels of performance. So the people in the future that want to design a system that's real time, you know, basically real time streaming data mm -hmm. that's informing an AI something, FPGAs could be right in the middle to help accelerate that process quicker? Absolutely. I mean, that is really one of the best uh, uh, performance benefits of FPGAs is we're really great at low latency applications, so we can run things as fast as anything. Um, and so for applications like uh, autonomous driving, you know, where a car has to make a split second decision or split microsecond decision as to what to do based on all these different sensor inputs, you know, FPGAs uh, can really provide that really fast type of processing. Um, you'll even see it in things like smart home applications, and we have all of these smart speakers that you can speak to. Yeah. And you don't want it to wait you know, several seconds for it to figure out, okay, what is it saying? How do I respond? You know, the faster that response time is, the more natural that interaction is, and that's when we'll start to really see um, you know, that growth of that technology. Um, and FPGAs are really great in kind of handling that uh, and running it very quickly at a very low latency. I would also like some sort of uh, thing to, to make sure that those smart home devices 
don't always turn on when I just say a name that sounds familiar. <laughs> They're getting <laughs> and, smarter every day. Yeah, they are. They are. So what do you see as the future for AI at Intel? And when I say the future, that probably means three to six months from yeah, now. Yeah, it is so moving fast, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we're just going to see a continued growth of uh, applications. I mean, I think if you look at uh, deep learning and AI, you know, the last few years has been really focused on image applications and image recognition. We're moving towards speech. Um, there's and emotions. Be, and emotions, yeah, yeah, I saw that talk, yeah. um, this morning. Um, and then we're starting to see more reinforcement learning and robotics. So, I mean, really the sky's the limit. I think that um, just the way that we've seen computing take over the world, like you mentioned, you know, software taking over the world, I think AI can be really applied to every industry out there. And if you could apply AI to any industry or any problem in the world that you could solve with AI, what would you tackle? I mean, I think one of the most interesting ones is, is healthcare, right? We have so much data that's starting to come in now. We have a genomic sequencing that's happening, and so you can really apply um, AI because it's such a complex problem um, of being able to apply new algorithms to find new cures and, and root causes to, to different um, diseases, I mean, I think that can be really hugely beneficial to the world. Yeah, more than just another DNA relative match. Right. That's something that actually is going to affect your life. Absolutely. Yeah, your health. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Well, Nicola, if we sat down 12 months from now and had the same conversation, what do you think will change in the market will be the most significant? Hmm. I mean, I think what's going to change is is really the the growth in the number of people that are really applying AI. Right now, I think a lot of people are still sort of researching it, trying to figure out how, how they want to apply it, right? Yeah. Um, as, as these use cases are starting to come out and as cus, um, companies really understand where it adds value to the organization, um, you're going to start seeing it really get adopted pretty widely and pretty quickly. Excellent. Well, we look forward to that conversation yeah. next year. Thank you. We'll be here.